Hi, I'm John Swanson. I'm a historian uh, and a professor of history at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Uh, and I'm happy to be here with you today. I spoke to you in 2018 when, when the event was actually still in New York. Um, and then last year I participated um, via video as we are doing again this year. And I really need to thank Hannah for inviting me to participate again. I'm very happy to be here and to talk a little bit about this region, Subcarpathian Rus, um, which interests me quite a bit as a scholar, um, and to talk to you a little bit about um, why that is and perhaps give you some things to think about. And just as a quick reminder, um, I, I, teach, uh, I teach history in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And I'm a historian, what I would say mainly of Central and Eastern Europe, mainly again 19th and 20th centuries. And um, recently I've been working on a, on a longer project about uh, Subcarpathian Rus, um, specifically about the Jewish communities of that region and, and their neighbors. Uh, in the time period, mainly before the Holocaust. And some of you may remember, I, I mentioned this last year, and I probably mentioned it in 2018 as well, my interest in the region um, started with the Auschwitz album, which I'm sure almost all of you are probably aware of. Um, I'm very interested in the album and in the woman who found the album, uh, Lily Jacob, who's from the community of Bilke, and so my, my project has really been, has, or at least has been developing as a kind of micro study of the community of Bilke, uh, as well as Lili Jacob in the, in the time period, in the decades prior to the Holocaust. And so I would, uh, maybe I should just say at the beginning, if anybody has any information about Bilke, um, or really about any, anything, if you're interested in getting a hold of me and maybe sharing some information, uh, please do, um, and you can reach me via Hana. She has my contact information. Um, what I could say at the beginning as well is that it's always difficult to speak to an audience that you don't interact with, um, in the sense that uh, I'm speaking to a camera, and I'm uh, not always sure what people know or they don't know or where there might be questions. Um, I mean, when I teach in the classroom, I very much like to interact with students and get a sense of what they know, and I can build on that and try to and figure out um, what, where I should be saying more things, or perhaps even saying less, less, less things. Um, but because we're in the situation we are, let me just provide you with a little bit of context uh, about the region, about Subcarpathian Rus, even though, and this is the problem, a lot of you probably know quite a bit. Um, some of you, many of you were born there, and, but I'm guessing that your children and, and your grandchildren pro probably do not know quite as much. So again, I'd like to provide a little bit of background information, a little bit of context before I talk about, really I'm only going to talk about one example uh, of information that t might tell us something about Jewish life in Subcarpathian Rus. Um, in the interwar period, in the, again, in the decades before the Holocaust. So this region of Subcarpathian Rus, and I've used this term uh, a few times already, and probably all of you know that there are multiple ways to designate this region. Uh, Subcarpathian Rus um, really comes from the Czechoslovak, or the, let's call it the Czech uh, designation for the region in the interwar period. Um, today, it's referred to as, as Transcarpathia. It really just depends on your view, you're viewing it from, from Kiev or you're viewing it from Prague, uh, if it's trans or, or sub. Um, in English, more, that's been folk using more, people use more often Subcarpathian Rus, but that's not always true. Probably all of you or many of you also know the Hungarians have a separate, uh, a, a separate term that they used. Um, or they still use Karpatia. This region had belonged to the Kingdom of Hungary for, for centuries. 
Since the late 19th century, it mainly comprised of four separate Hungarian counties. And then at the end of the First World War, uh, when Austria-Hungary was defeated in the First World War in 1918, this region was detached from what was left of the Kingdom of, of Hungary, and it was given to the new state of Czechoslovakia. So for most of the interwar period, uh, until the Second World War, it belonged to Czechoslovakia. It was a, it was a region of Czechoslovakia, and usually people think of this period, the Czechoslovak period for Subcarpathian Rus, as a very positive period. But there's more and more, excuse me, um, studies that are pointing out it wasn't, there were, there were difficulties, and difficulties in the sense that Prague treated sub, uh, Subcarpathian Rus in many ways as a colony, and they did a number of things that actually um, uh, encouraged and allowed anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric and activity um, during this period, during that period. So it belonged to Czechoslovakia until 1938. Well, that's a little more complicated than that, but in 1938, in the, in the fall of 1938, when Nazi Germany began to dismantle, dismantle Czechoslovakia, part of Subcarpathian Rus was given to the state of Hungary, which was at the time an ally of Nazi Germany. It was the southern portion of Subcarpathian Rus, including the, the large cities, such as um, Uzgorod, Mukachevo, Berdohovo were given uh, to Hungary. The northern part, the mount, mainly the mountainous part of Subcarpathian Rus, um, with, with the center at the time then when the city of Hust um, still belonged to what was left of Czechoslovakia. In 19, this is fall of 1938. In March of 1939, at the, around the same time that, that, well, basically the Nazis are continuing to carve up Czechoslovakia, Slovakia declares independence. The um, the representative, Ukrainian Rusin representatives in Hust declare independence in March of 1939 for Subcarpathian Rus, uh, and the Hungarians immediately invade that territory. Uh, and so within a day, the Hungarians then took over the rest of Subcarpathian Rus. Um, and so in 1939, all of that region again became part of the Kingdom of Hungary. Um, and you probably all know that during the Second World War, so well, after that, after, mainly during the war, and especially at the time of the Holocaust, the Hungarians were in control of this region. And then in 1945, what was Subcarpathian Rus, now Transcarpa Transcarpathia, is given to the Soviet Union. Um, and then, as you know, today it is a part of, of the independent state of Ukraine. Uh, it's actually known. It's a the Transcarpathian Oblast is a is a is a region of Western Ukraine. Um, this region was also a very multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious region. And just to kind of give you a sense, I'm going to give you just a few numbers um, from the 1930 census. So this would have been the Czechoslovak census. They only did two in the time period that they controlled the region, 1921 and 1930. In 1930, in this region, which in Czechoslovakia was a separate region, Subcarpathian Rus, there were 447,000 447, Rusins and Ukrainians and Russians. They were all lumped together. That's also a long discussion about why they're lumped together and why maybe they shouldn't have been. Or, but let's, at the moment, Rusins, uh, Ukrainians and Russians, 447,000. Hungarians in the region, uh, even though many had, some had left, there were still 109,000 Hungarians in Subcarpathian Rus in 1930, 91,000 Jews, so 447,000 Rusins, Ukrainians, Russians, uh, 109,000 Hungarians, and 91,000 Jews. There were only 34,000 Czechs and Slovaks as, as a combined group. Um, there were also 13,000 Germans, and there was also a large number of Roma uh, and a smaller number of Romanians and, uh, and a very, at this point, a very small number of Poles also lived in Subcarpathian Rus. And so it had this kind of, as I said, a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious sense, and... Um, 
I'm gonna, I wanna read to you a, um, a, a dialogue that I'm sure all of you know some variation of this dialogue. Um, and it goes like this. Where were you born? I was born in, Austria -Hung in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy of Emperor Franz Joseph. Where did you study? In Czechoslovakia under Benes. Where did you do military service? In the Kingdom of Hungary in the army of Horty Miklos. Where did you work? In the Soviet Union. Where did you retire? In Ukraine. Wow, you've traveled a lot. Actually, I never left Mukachevo. So what am I doing? I am, as a historian, I'm looking at this region. As a historian, this is where I could probably talk for hours, but at least let me just quickly say, as a historian, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take information that we know, that people have already looked at and, and, and kind of concluded some things. I try to look for new information, and I try to figure out to explain things, try to perhaps even explain how something happened and maybe, maybe even perhaps why, even though the why question is always extremely difficult. Uh, and especially when we talk about the Holocaust, it's not always possible to perhaps know the exact reason as to why something happened. We, we could have maybe multiple reasons, um, multiple causes uh, to e an event. <coughs> Um, I was going to also just quickly say is that my, most of you probably also know that people like Elie Wiesel or Primo Levi have also argued or argued earlier um, that the Holocaust is, an ex is very difficult to explain or perhaps not explainable. Um, but my, the point is, what I would, I would argue, that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it, and I don't think that's what they said either, um, that we should continue to talk about, about it to remember it, um, and make sure we don't forget about it. And especially, this is extremely important uh, at this time when many survivors are, will not be with us in a few years. So in the um, time remaining, I'm not gonna answer any big question. Um, I'm going to just give you one piece of information and then propose some ideas of what that piece of information might tell us. And this information is regarding school records um, in the interwar period, in the Czechoslovak time period uh, of Subcarpathian Rus. Um, and I have spent some time in various archives, well, in different places, um, in, in, uh, in Europe, in Ukraine, uh, also in Israel, um, and uh, in the Transcarpathian State Archives in Berdohovo, I have all came across and I looked through a lot of school records, especially for the community of Bilka, which is where my interest is at the moment. Um, and that's what I would like to talk about. Um, <clears throat> in the or, in in Subcarpathian Rus during uh, the time period it was in Czechoslovakia, um, there were Czech schools, Czechoslovak Czech schools throughout the communities in Subcarpathian Rus. There were also very often minority schools, especially Rusin schools uh, in the communities. Sometimes there were also Hungarian schools, uh, and there were at times Hebrew schools as well. Uh, some of you probably know that in Mukachevo there was a very famous he uh, Hebrew gymnasium um, uh, in Mukachevo during the interwar period. Most Jews in Subcarpathian Rus in this time period, let's say in the 1930s, in the 1930s, the majority of Jews, over 65%, uh, sent, uh, sent their children to the Czech schools. They chose to send them to Czech schools. Um, I should also just quickly mention that the, the number of Czechs, or Czech speakers, Czech even Czechoslovaks, um, was quite small. I mentioned earlier there's only 34,000 in the entire region, um, and most of them, of the children who had been going to school, would have been uh, the children of administrators who had been sent for, by Prague to administer and control the region. There were various, there are various re, uh, reasons why Jews often sent their children to Czech schools. The most common argument that people make is that 
the Jews of the region um, were very loyal to the, the, sta the state in control. That is, they had been very loyal to the Hungarian state prior to 1918, and now they were being very loyal to the Czechoslovak state. Um, yet there are other arguments for this. Uh, Jews often avoided the Rusin schools, which, were, again, in almost all communities would have a Rusin school um, for different reasons. One is that the Rusin schools um, were usually more aligned with religious education, mainly Greek Greek Catholic education. Uh, also, Orthodox Jewish parents, Jewish parents preferred Czech schools because they were willing to accommodate Jewish religion, religious needs. And that the level of education very often in the Rusin schools was not as high as in the Czech schools. And the other, I was going to say smaller, but maybe it's not even a smaller complication, is that the language of instruction in the Rusin schools was often Rusin or some dialect of Rusin, or it could be Ukrainian or it could be Russian. Um, it also created some confusion in those schools. Um, and the religious Jews, uh, the Orthodox religious Jews of the region, uh, which was the in, uh, were the majority in most of the communities, including Bilke, um, they, they chose the secular Czech education. One also needs to keep in mind that during this time period, the boys, the Jewish boys, continued to attend Cheder, both before Czech school and afterwards as well. That continued throughout the entire um, interwar period. Now, in the community of Bilke, there was a Czech elementary school. There was a Rusin school. I have not been able to find evidence if there was a Hungarian school, but I'm guessing there probably was. And I just want to talk a little bit about this Czech school uh, in the community of Bilke. So in the Czech school in Bilke, during the year 1936 to 1937, there were 35 students, 14 boys and 21 girls who were there at the beginning of the school year in September in 1936. Only 25 of them actually finished in 1937. Out of those 25, there were 11 boys and 14 girls. I have no reason what happened to the 10 people who, who, who didn't finish. In this school, there were six teachers. Most of them taught more than two subjects. The subjects in a Czech school that most of the, the Jews attended uh, consisted of religion, civics, language and writing, geography, history, natural sciences, mathematics, drawing, handwriting, singing, handicraft for boys, handicraft, handicraft and home economics, um, or home education, is, uh, handicrafts and home education for girls, physical education, Subcarpathian language, Rusin language, but the, it was in the, in the grade book, it said Subcarpathian language, and German language in the community of Bielka in 1936-1937. For the 32 students for whom there are grades, th tw uh, of the 32, 23 of them were Jews, were, were identified as Jews in the grade book. Um, two were Czechoslovak Hussites of a separate Czechoslovak church. There was one Greek Catholic, very unclear why there was the one Greek Catholic in, that, in the Czech school uh, in, who didn't go to the, the Rusin school. There was one student without a religion uh, and five Roman Catholics in the Czech school. Again, out of 32, 23 Jews in the Czech school. Regarding religion, that is the subject of religion, it is also interesting to point out um, that all students were, um, were required to attend religi uh, religious instruction, except the two Czechoslovak church pupils, the Hussite, Czechoslovak Hussite students, and the one without, without a religion. They didn't attend. In the list of teachers and subjects, religion is listed. So when they had it, that was listed and it was penciled in Israelite religion studies. 
as the only religious uh, subject. It is interesting that the person who wrote this in Czech, Israelite Religion Studies, made a spelling mistake, which probably demonstrates that he or she did not know Czech well enough, the brand new language of the region, well, they didn't know it well enough to actually spell it correctly. Um, Jewish studies, or this Israelite religion studies, was the only option. And there was only one teacher listed who taught religion. I would guess that the non-Jewish students attended separate religious lessons, but this is unclear. They all received grades. Now, this kind of documentation can perhaps confirm that Jews and Subcarpathian Rus were loyal to the state in charge. At this point, the Czechoslovak state. Um, it also demonstrates, or these records also demonstrate, that Jewish parents, even religious pa Jewish parents, uh, supported the Czech schools. And that Orthodox Jewish parents preferred these Czech schools, even so, not so much in Bilka, but in other communities, over, they, they preferred the Czech schools over Zionist-leaning Hebrew alternatives, when the, where there were Hebrew schools. Perhaps this tells us that the Jewish inhabitants felt very connected to the region, to their towns and villages, at least that they wanted their, their, their children to succeed, to, to uh, be part of this new Czechoslovakia. Um, but the, this is the dilemma of the historian. We have information and we can think about conclusions, um, but we perhaps will never know all of the answers. So I hope I've given you something to think about, uh, and even some new ideas and new information that you pro perhaps didn't know. Um, and so I really thank you for listening to me today and for watching uh, the video. Um, and um, as I said earlier, if you would like to be in touch with me, I'm very happy uh, to hear from you. And you can get my contact information from Hannah. And I hope to see you in New York next year. And again, thank you very much.